Hello everyone, welcome to my first paint along video. Today we'll be working on this Gumlock Chief. Take a look at this little guy. It's right off the printer, fresh, nothing on him. Here's a look at the supplies I'm using. There's a few things I forgot to put up here, but I'll try to note them as we go along. You also don't need all this stuff, or you can use more, whatever you want. And I'll try to give you some ideas of other things you can be doing as we go. The first thing you need to do is clean up your mini. I did that off camera because I spaced. But you want to go through whether you 3D printed or you purchased at the store and clear off any mold lines or any printing artifacts and just get it nice and ready for a paint. I'm using Rust-Oleum 2X Paint and Primer Flat Black that I picked up at Lowe's. These are the main couple of brushes I use. I have these two makeup brushes I picked up at the Dollar Tree, and I like these better than the actual mini dry brushing brushes that I have. And these two others are both from Army Painter. One is Insane Detail, and the other is Highlighting. Here's the palette that I'm going to be using, although in this video I don't end up using it a whole lot. It's just the backing board from a pad of paper with some kitchen parchment paper taped to it. You definitely don't need the fanciest materials to start doing a decent job at painting minis. I like using two jars of water, one to wash, one to rinse. And here's my super fancy custom miniature painting handle. My hands are giant and shake really bad. This bottle just happens to be the right shape for me. And then to help control the shaking, I filled it with concrete. So it's weighted down and keeps me from shaking as bad. Then there's just some poster tack on the top to stick your mini to. As I'm sure you can see, everything here is super high tech, top of the line, nothing but the best. See, look at that. He's not going anywhere I don't want him to. Since I forgot to show you how I cleaned up the model, I at least wanted to show you what they look like when they come off the printer. They have all these supports on them and you have to clean up where they touch the model, which I just do by scraping with an X-Acto knife. All right, time to start painting. Starting off with Army Painter's Matte White. Put a little here on the palette. And we're going to start dry brushing on some xenothal highlights. Start by getting a little bit onto this makeup brush and then wiping most of it off. You should feel like you're wasting a, a good amount of paint when you're dry brushing. So I'm wiping most of it off on this paper towel and then I'll test it on my thumb to make sure I've got the right amount. There we go. Almost nothing. It takes quite a few swipes before you start seeing it show up on my thumb and that's exactly, that's exactly where we want to be. So here we go. We're going to start doing the xenothal highlights. The whole point of this is to show what the light looks like coming down. You're building up the highlights and the contrast between that and the shadows. And you can see immediately as we start doing this, as you're dragging the brush across, it's just hitting the peaks of the details in the sculpt and leaving the shadow in all the valleys. And you can do this as little or as much as you want. You can push it pretty far. When I finished with this, I actually wish I went a little further here than I did because he ends up a little darker than I'd like. I would have liked him to turn out a little more vibrant and a little brighter. But we're not here to be perfect. Each time you paint a mini, you learn a little bit more, and the next one turns out even better. So everything's a learning experience. The key is to just not be afraid. I've heard so many people say that they're afraid to start painting their minis, and that's actually the reason I decided to start doing these little paint-along videos so you guys can see what I'm doing and that it's not... It's not really that complicated. You guys can sit down and do this too. Now I'm doing these zenithal highlights because I'm using contrast paints, which are transparent. So you'll be able to see all of this grayscale between the black and the white that we're building up here through the paints that we're going to be putting on top. If you don't have contrast paints or transparent paints, you can skip this step. You don't need to do this highlighting step at the start. You can skip right to just filling in the colors with your regular paints and then come back afterwards and do basically the same thing we're doing here, uh, which you can also do with some colors and just build up highlights that way after the regular paints have gone on. As I said earlier, I wish I had gone a little further with this step. It didn't turn out quite as bright and colorful as I would have liked. I actually think the next one that I do, I might prime with a gray and go from there. That way I'm not working with it as dark to start with. That's a personal preference though, depends on what you like. The point of these videos isn't to show you the right way to do anything. There is no right way to do this. I'm just showing you what I'm doing. Hopefully you'll pick up some things and how I'm doing it's going to change too. I'm actually still fairly new at this, so we'll see how things go. This part is really important though. Keeping your brushes clean extends their life and their usefulness. With these cheap dry brushes, it's not too big of a deal, but with the other brushes, you want to make sure you keep them clean. 
It's how you keep them from fraying and frizzing and losing their edges. It's really important to keep the point, especially at this small of a scale. If they don't have the point, then you're not going to be able to do the, the detail work. One of the few specific recommendations I'll make is that you should get some brush cleaning soap. And then after every session of painting, you should clean it with the soap and you can use it to reshape the tip itself. And you can end up keeping your brushes perfect for years this way. I'll go ahead and put a link to what I use down in the supplies list below. All right, time to get some color on this little dude. I'm starting off with ironed in yellow. Again, you don't have to have these specific paints, just use what you've got. I started off with the Army Painter starter kit. I find it really helpful when I'm starting to paint a mini to use a photo reference. A lot of the stuff that we're going to be painting uh, isn't real. So with the Gomlocks, these little goblins I created, I tend to use tree frogs as my reference. And in nature, there's quite a bit of variety within these species and stuff. So you can find all sorts of different directions you can go. With this, I'm going with a yellow and a green and a little bit of red. But you can find references of any color. Just do a Google image search of blue frog or red lizard and just find something that interests you and go with that. In fact, the next time I paint Gomlox, I'm going to do a blue and a red one. We'll see, see how those look. So I'm starting off here by hitting the hands and the feet, and I'll be doing his underbelly and like up into his jaw, basically what would be his underside if he were on all fours, following along with the tree frog reference that I looked at. And as we're going through this video, you can watch and see, see my shaky hands getting in here. Uh, there's different things you can do to mitigate shakiness if, if that's an issue for you. It's important to be in a comfortable position. I usually have my elbows or my forearms resting against the desk to kind of anchor myself. Like I showed you before, my handle is full of concrete and it's big and fits my hand well. So having some weight to the handle helps control the shaking. And then I've been an illustrator and drawing since I was a little kid and I've just gotten used to timing out my shaking. So as I'm doing things, I kind of, I let my shake do the dabbing for me. Like I'll get close and just let my hand stutter towards what I'm aiming at until it starts making contact. And then just kind of direct where it goes from there. Painting things that are this small is definitely a challenge, especially for me, like again, reiterating giant, giant hands and shaking with this tiny, tiny little figure that's smaller than one of my knuckles. But it's doable if you just work at it and put in some practice. All right, switching over to Warp Lightning. This is the green that I went with. We'll go through and just fill in, fill in the rest of his skin here. Now you saw me a second ago shaking the hell out of that paint can. Uh, every one of my paint containers I put a little ball bearing into. I believe the ones I use are actually from Army Painter. I don't know, I put them in a different container, so I don't remember. But having a ball bearing in there, just like in a, in a rattle can, in a spray can, so as you're shaking it, the ball bearing is in there, helping you mix up any pigment that's separated from the actual medium. Now that we're getting the color on here, you can start to see how this specific process works. The transparent paint is going on there, but you can still see the highlights and the shadows coming in from below. And before you paint, you want to kind of get an order of operations in your head, at least. I try to think of things in layers. So you want to start with the bottom layer and work your way up. So the yellow on the belly, painting wise, is under the layer for the green. So I want to come over with the green and just kind of meet where the yellow is and overlap just a tiny bit. And then from there, what's sitting on top of the skin, what accessory comes next, what's on top of that accessory. So. With these guys, that's not too complicated, but if you were working with something that had more clothing and more accessories, you would go skin and then what the next direct piece of clothing is. And then if there's an accessory on top of that clothing, um, if that accessory has something like a jewel in it, you would do that towards the end. Um, just again, got to think of things in layers and work. I try to work from the bottom to the top or from the interior to the exterior. And I feel like by doing this, you're just, you're mitigating chances of messing up the, the layer below that. You're still gonna have those issues where your brush slips and hits something that you've already got nicely painted and you have to come back and touch it up. But doing it this way, for me at least, seems to mitigate most of that and keep it to a 
a bare minimum. So I'm working on the feathers here. I did yellow on the bottom, about two thirds of each of them, and then red on the tips. And then I'm coming back with yellow again in the middle just to blend those two colors together. And since I've got the red out already, I'm gonna go ahead and do the accents on the tips of his fingers and the tips of his toes. So I'm gonna go through and just do a little bit on the, the tips of each of these. It'll be a good, good pop of color in on his skin. And then it also ties in with the, the headdress. So anytime you can tie together things like that, it just adds to the aesthetic and brings everything together. Now that the red's on there, I'm gonna go back with the yellow and do the same thing I did on the headdress and where the two colors meet, add in the yellow and it'll help blend the two colors together. Ah, look at this little guy. You can see the highlights coming through still in his skin. Everything's starting to come together. We're done with the base layer on the skin now, so we can move up to the next layer. So we're gonna go through with this snake bite leather and hit his leather accessories. So I'm starting with the belt here. And you can see my hands are shaking pretty bad and trying to do this small, thin little strip is a little bit of a, a task, but I just try to shoot for the middle and then my shaking, just kind of control it a little bit and let it hit up towards the edges. And you don't have to be perfect. I'm going over the lines and it's hitting some of the skin, but it's small and you can't see too much of that. It doesn't really show through in the final product. It looks, it looks pretty good at the end. Also, to help with the shaking, I've got both of my arms anchored down to the desk pretty well. And then I've got my brush hand pressed up against the handle. That way I'm kind of, I've got to synchronizing the shaking between the two hands. That way they're not independently moving around and making it even worse. I got ahead of myself a little bit while I was doing this and did the loincloths in the leather, which I wasn't really planning on doing. I was going to do the skeleton hoard on that just to make the belt and the loincloth look like they're two different materials, help it pop a little more, but it looks all right with all of it being the same color. And if I would have done the loincloths in the skeleton hoard color, I would have also done the bracers in that color. But since I had already gone that route, I went ahead and made the bracers the same color just to help tie them together. And now I'm going in and hitting the little bit of the cap underneath the headdress that kind of holds everything to his head. It's hard to see, but it's in there. And now we break out the skeleton horde and go ahead and hit the skull itself. And this is one of my favorite paints. It does exactly, it does exactly what the name implies. It just makes everything look like old dusty bones. And it really shows off all of the contrasts that we built up earlier when we dry brushed on all of the highlights at the beginning. All right, now onto the last accessory. We're gonna start working on the necklace here. So I'm gonna be using Rune Fang Steel. I want this necklace to be a nice bright gold, so I'm going with the brightest silver metallic color that I have, and we'll get a nice base coat on there, and then we're going to come back and tint it with a yellow, and that'll make a really nice bright gold that'll contrast well with the rest of his skin. So I'm using Tamiya X24 Clear Yellow. These Tamiya Clear Colors are my favorite way to get any kind of colored or tinted metal. They're super translucent, so everything is really bright and the colors pop. They're not as easy to find out in stores. You can sometimes find them in like hobby shops or model train stores. I end up getting them on Amazon because I can't find them where I'm at. And here I'm switching over to the X27 clear red. And I'm gonna hit this giant jewel in the, the center of his necklace and turn it into a, a big ruby. This was definitely the hardest part for me to paint with my hands shaking, but I just took it slow and tried to push the paint from the center out towards the edge and find the line on the edge of the sculpt. And at this point, Jack reminded me that it was time for us to go for a walk. All right, we've got the base colors done now. Time to work on the eyes. Eyes are so small on these sculpts that they're not worth me trying to mess around with a brush. There's no way I can personally do that. So I use a Micron pen to go in and, and just fill it in black. I don't, I don't really mess around with other, other stuff on the eyes. They're so small that it's hard to see any more detail. And at least for me, it's not, not somewhere where I want to spend my time.
Look at that though, that, that really brought them to life. Next I'm going to move on to doing a wash with this Army Painter Strong Tone. It's like a dark brownish black. It will just come through here and deepen up all the shadows on everything except for the necklace. I like how the necklace looks. I don't want to don't want to dull that down at all. Now this wash is going to go into all the little crevices and low points and deepen up the shadows. But it's also going to dull down the highlights a little bit, which is okay because we're going to come back through and do some more targeted highlights with a different color. That way we can build some contrast within the colors themselves and really make this little guy look nice. And for the highlights, for pretty much all of it, I'm going to use this demonic yellow. It's going to brighten up the greens on his skin. It's also going to highlight and brighten up the reds and the yellows. And then on the skull here, I'm just going to use a little bit of white. And right away, you can see we're bringing back the highlights on these raised edges. And now between these highlights and the wash that we did before, there's a really good amount of contrast in the colors there. And it really brings depth and life to something that's only, you know, an inch tall. And now over to the yellows. I'm going to go really light to start with. I don't want to overdo it. So I'm just going to do light passes and build up in the areas where the light's going to be hitting from above and just start bringing out these details again. I'm using a smaller brush than I was before. This pack of makeup brushes that I got from the dollar store came with a, a larger and a smaller. And the small one's really good for getting into tight areas like the crook of his neck or between his arm and his body. And while I was doing that, uh, the raised area in the eye got hit pretty good, which is all right. It, it gives it a nice interior shine, but I decided to go back with the strong tone and do my best to nicely cover it and give it a, a little bit of translucence. And you can see the shine through it and there's a little more depth in his eyes now, which is something I wasn't planning on doing when I started this, but it turned out all right. And at this point, I'm pretty happy with how he's looking. So I'm gonna go through with matte black and just clean up the base and make it look nice and crisp and clean. Getting in between his toes is the hardest part here. So like most things, I try to get some paint in a clear and workable opening and then push it towards the edge of where I'm trying to get to. And there we go, a nice clean base. And here we are, look at this little dude. He's got a good amount of contrast. You can see the highlights, you can see the details. There's some deep shadows. I would like them to be a little brighter, so I would do it a little different next time. But that's the fun of painting miniatures. You learn a little bit more every time you paint one, and there's always 10 more that you need to paint on your desk. So always opportunities to learn and grow. If you have access to a 3D printer and you want to print this guy, he's available in our mini hoarder store, and there's a link to that in the notes below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.